All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We're so glad that you carved some time and space today to be with us uh, to hear about this very important topic of improving health outcomes for older adults through age-friendly health systems. So as we get going, I'm just going to touch on a few rules of engagement here. Your audio for the webinar can be accessed in two ways, either through your computer or through your phone. If you do choose to access through the phone, please do remember to mute your computer speaker so that you don't get any feedback there. We will be holding a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. However, you can feel free to submit written questions um, at any point throughout the presentation. To do so, you will type your question into the chat area. And you can go ahead and send that at any time. We'll be watching for and collecting those in order to address them at the end in our Q&A session. Other notable features we want you to be aware of, this session is being recorded. The chat, however, will not be included in the recording. And again, on the chat, uh, you can utilize that throughout the webinar, not just to submit a question, but to chat to the group. But you're going to want to make sure that as the picture on your screen shows that your, your chat reflects the fact that you're sending that chat to everyone rather than to a specific individual. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Autumn Branch, uh, Program Manager at the AHA, to start today's presentation. She'll introduce you to our speakers. Thank you so much, Rhonda. Um, as she mentioned, my name is Autumn Branch. I am a program manager here at the American Hospital Association. Um, I'm also joined by our amazing performance improvement coach, Maneshwar Singh. He does he won't be hopping uh, on the mic today, but he'll be in the chat to address any questions you have about the action community, age-friendly health systems, or any of our general programming. We are also joined by two wonderful speakers, uh, Christine Jensen and Elisa Lemon from Riverside Health who will be talking about their age-friendly uh, journey, and they were a part of our last action community. Mm -hmm. So just a quick overview of uh, the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to now jump into an overview of age-friendly health systems in addition to an overview of the action community. From there, uh, I'll transition over to Christy and Elisa to talk about um, age-friendly uh, care at Riverside Health. Uh, we'll, we can swap those last two where I'll talk about how you can join an action community, um, and then uh, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So first things first, um, I see there are, are a lot of people who have joined us today. So good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, and thank you for joining us. Um, but recognizing that we all are coming into this presentation today with different understandings of what exactly an age-friendly health system is. So with that, I kindly ask you all to use the chat function to share what does age-friendly mean to you? When you hear the term age-friendly, what comes to mind? What does age-friendly mean to you? Yes, age-appropriate, person-centered care, absolutely. Respectful, appropriate care, protecting our elderly with regard to social determinants of health, holistic care, practices geared towards age, addressing the four M's. Yes, the four M's, thank you for mentioning those. Uh, we'll highlight those as we go throughout the presentation. Non-discriminatory, not discriminating by age. Absolutely, these are great responses. Thank you, everyone. If you haven't had a chance to share, please continue um, sharing in the chat. And yes, improving care for older adults, a safe space in any setting. Yes, for banks, hospitals, social service orgs. Now we're getting into that uh, ecosystem of age-friendly care. Um, but yes, thank you all for sharing. Those are all great answers. Um, so before we move forward through the presentation, we must acknowledge um, the John A. Hartford Foundation. And they are the reason that we are all here and able to do the work that we are doing today. Uh, the John A. Hartford Foundation is a private philanthropy that is based in New York um, and established by owners of the AMP grocery chain in 1929. Again, they are the reason that we can do this work and they support and fund so many other amazing initiatives that um, are geared towards improving care for older adults. 
So why age-friendly health systems? Um, as we know, um, the amount of older adults is increasing and each of those, well, not each of those, but the older adults also might have multiple conditions um, that need to be cared for in the best way. So age-friendly health systems is an, is an initiative that works to make sure that all care for older adults is, um, is age-friendly care. So looking at the connection between age-friendly health systems as a movement, um, we'll also see a lot of alignment with a lot of priorities for the American Hospital Association. Um, here you'll see uh, the pillars of our strategic plan, in addition to a new initiative that we have this year called the Patient Safety Initiative, which uh, includes three tiers, which are uh, fostering a culture of safety, from the board room to the bedside, um, identifying and addressing inequities in safety and enhancing workforce safety, which we know are is an important thing um, in today's day and time. Uh, but I just wanted to share these to highlight that age-friendly health systems is a patient safety initiative. So what is an age-friendly health system? So many of you in the chat have already shared what we call the four Ms. The four Ms is a set of evidence-based um, practices that have come together to basically outline how uh, older, uh, how care for older adults should be approached. So the four Ms are what matters to the older adult, medication, mentation, and mobility. And we like to think of what matters as the core or the foundation of the of the four Ms because what matters to that older adult should inform the medications that they're given or the medications that they're taking, how we approach mentation and also getting them up and up and going, right? Um, when we think about mobility. And the other important thing to note when we're looking at the four Ms is that the goal is to make sure that they are working together as a set and not just an individual thing. But again, what matters to that older adult is kind of getting to the idea of the patient-centered care, right? So what was our goal? Um, when we started this movement, I think back in 2017, um, the goal was to build a social movement so that all care for older adults is age-friendly care. And again, it's guided by an essential set of evidence-based practices, which we call the four Ms. It causes no harm, and it is consistent with what matters to the older adults and their family. And we are so excited to report that we started this with two goals, right? The first goal being to spread to 1,000 sites by the end of 2020, and that second goal being to spread to 2,600 sites uh, by June of 2023. As of last month, we have exceeded more than 4,000 sites who have joined and been a part of this movement and have received that level one designation as an age-friendly health system. Um, with that, there is a level two uh, designation that I'll touch on a little bit uh, more later, but we are excited to share that more than 2,000, 2,100 teams um, have gone on to achieve that uh, designation as committed to care excellence. And the team that we have on the call today is one of those teams. All right, so overview of the action community. So we've talked about what age-friendly health systems is as an, as an initiative and as a movement, but we also want to talk about how you can become a part. How can you engage with us? And one of the easiest ways to do that is to participate in an action community. Um, so the action community is a seven-month virtual learning community, which basically allows your team to not only understand what the 4Ms framework is, but also test and learn how you want to implement uh, the 4Ms in your care setting. Because there are so many great teams, we usually have an average of about 150 teams who join the action community. It's also a very collaborative space where you can share ideas, you can learn from other, um, from other teams who might be in your care setting who are having a similar issue, um, and even from teams who aren't in your care setting, and they might have a, an approach to an issue that you're having that you can use or repurpose um, in your uh, setting of care. And so as you engage in the action community, again, it's a seven month learning collaborative and we have two different types of monthly webinars. The first is a 
team webinar, which is where we have expert faculty who join us to learn about uh, or to teach about the each of the four M's. So we do basically a deep dive once a month for each of the M's. Um, and then that second series of calls is called a topical call or a topical webinar series. And those are led by our amazing performance improvement coach, Manesh Var Singh. Um, and he pulls in speakers based on the needs of the action community. So if we see that there's, if we're getting a lot of questions about like Epic, how do we document all of this in Epic will bring in someone who's successfully done that. Um, if we see that there's a lot of questions around asking what matters, because it's such a nuanced, kind of ambiguous question, right? Then we'll bring in a expert who's done that successfully to uh, address any questions that you have. So, and that's why it's so important when you are a part of the action community to make sure that you're sharing those questions, sharing those challenges, but also sharing those successes so that we can continue to tailor the content towards the needs of our action community. Um, we've also historically had a virtual convening that takes place in February, but this year we'll actually be having an in-person meeting uh, with more details for that to come. And then again, it's a collaborative space. So it's an opportunity for, to, for you to share data, share your learnings, share your outcomes um, with each other, and also just get feedback. So on this slide, you'll see kind of like a, a step map <laughs> of uh, the ways that you will engage in the action community. Um, so we have our series of webinars, which start in October. We do have two kickoff calls, which will start next month. So if you haven't already enrolled, it is not too late. It's perfect timing, actually. Um, so we'll kick off with those set of uh, two kickoff calls that take place in September. And then we'll start uh, with our content um, and having our expert faculty join us in that two, uh, two webinar series every month. We'll start that in October. Um, and then we also have what we like to call our learning and action period, uh, which is provided for you in our getting started guide once you have registered for the action community. And the learning and action period is basically your baseline for where you should be at this point in the action community. So if we're in January 2025, you should be wrapping up learning and action period three and then transitioning into learning and action period four. I do see questions about how to sign up for the action community. Um, we'll drop a link in the chat so that you can uh, complete the commitment form. Uh, but then there's also a slide with some uh, information that you can uh, use as well. And then again, um, in April, let's just say spring of 2025, we will be having an in-person meeting, but more details on that to come. But just to know, in order to participate in the in-person meeting, you have to have participated in an action community. So this is the perfect time for you to enroll. And then again, yes, uh, spring or quarter two of 2025, we will have an in-person meeting here in Chicago, Illinois, with more details to come. All right, so again, when you enroll in the action community, not only is it an opportunity for you to um, learn, right, about the forums and learn from expert faculty and learn from each other, but this is where you're actually doing the work. We do recommend using the PDSA cycle as you're testing your interventions, but you can also work with our uh, performance improvement coach to design and adapt a workflow that works best for you and your team. So I mentioned these briefly as far as levels of recognition. There are two levels as part of the Age Friendly Health Systems movement. Um, I see about a cost for enrollment. It is completely free. The only cost is your time. Um, and with two webinars a month that are an hour, it's not that much. So join us. Uh, but yes, there are two, um, two levels of recognition. Um, it is not for U.S.-based organizations only. We have had some international teams join us as well. Um, Yes, but yeah, two levels of rec uh, recognition. The first being level one, recognized as an age-friendly health systems participant. And the way that you achieve that is by submitting your 4M's care description, which we like to call the action plan. This is, hey, I've learned what all the 4M's are, and this is how I'm going to integrate them into the way that we care for older adults. Once you've submitted that, and we'll work with you through the form, um, and if you have questions, again, you can meet with our performance improvement coach. Um, but as you complete that form's care description, you will submit that to IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, which is another one of our partners in this work. And they will uh, either approve 
or make you a conditional participant where they'll give you feedback. And then we can work together to make sure that your care description meets the uh, meets the requirements and get that approved. After you have your 4M's care description approved, now it's time to put that action plan into action. And so as you're working to uh, basically implement that 4M's care description plan that you worked with your team to outline, um, you are gonna count every month how many older adults have been impacted by that plan, by the 4M's care. And once you submit three months count of older adults that have been impacted by that care, you will then receive level two designation, which is committed to care excellence for older adults. And both, achieving both of these uh, levels of recognition is very realistic within the action community, as long as you stay in alignment with the uh, learning and action periods. But again, we're here to support you however you need it. And if you are, if the action community is coming to a close and you still need support with achieving level one or level two recognition, we are always here uh, to support you. In addition to support, we have an, uh, an abundance of resources available to you on our website. Uh, just a few examples is uh, the What Matters Guide, the What Matters Toolkit. Um, so that's tackling how to ask what matters to older adults and get to the bottom of that. Um, the guide to using the four M's in the care for older adults, um, calculating ROI, building a business case, and so many more um, resources that can be found at our webpage, which is aha.org slash agefriendly. And then just highlighting a few outcomes, as we mentioned, in order to get level two recognition, you have to submit that three months count. And based on the data that we've received so far, more than 3 million older adults have been reached with 4M's care. Uh, some of the hospitals that are listed here have also noted decreased fall rates, decreased length of stay, decreased readmissions, and increases in cost savings as a result of implementing the 4M's. Um, and then we also have some testimonials here, which I won't read, but just highlighting um, the great experiences that teams have had in an AHA action community. So if you are interested in joining the action community, I know the link was dropped in the chat. Um, and then I also know you were sent a copy of this presentation with the hyperlink for the invitation guide. Um, it gives you the uh, schedule of events at a glance um, and also links to join uh, the webinars that will start in, um, in October. But yes, if you haven't joined, please join us again. The uh, If you haven't registered, please register so that you can join us and take part um, in this movement. So with that, I am going to now turn it over to our speakers for today, uh, Christine Jensen and Elisa Lemon. Thanks, Autumn, and thanks, Rhonda, for inviting us today. Um, we're representing Riverside Health System. It's in the eastern part of Virginia, and in just a few minutes, you'll get to know a little bit more about the makeup of the hospital where we focused our efforts to earn the H Friendly Health System designation as level two. Um, so my name is Christy Jensen, and I'm a gerontologist by training and um, have been supporting these efforts alongside Elisa. So I'll pass it to her to offer a quick introduction before we jump into our content. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Elisa Lemon. I am a registered nurse with Riverside Health System. I do work at one of their um, four hospitals, um, um, Riverside Doctors Hospital in Williamsburg. So here's what we hope to cover over the next 20 or 25 minutes. And it was great hearing Autumn just kind of remind us about where we had been about two years ago at this time. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of our time frame. So we want to let you know a little bit about the approach within our healthcare system. So Riverside Health, um, as I mentioned, in the eastern part of Virginia, has about 10,000 employees. I guess I'd consider it a moderately sized healthcare system. And we have about... Um, 3,500 folks that work in four of our different hospitals. And again, we're going to talk about one of those specifically, but we also um, have a large number of primary and specialty care, adult day, uh, long-term care, um, palliative care hospice. Uh, so we really have a great commitment to serving older adults. So the, the timing really was uh, right for us. And then when we had the invitation to join the action community, uh, we'll talk with you just a little bit more about why that was so helpful to us. 
highlight some of our achievements and milestones, some of the challenges and lessons learned. Elisa's gonna walk you through some snapshots and screenshots of EPIC, our electronic health record. And then we'll uh, leave you with a few of kind of our next steps and questions as we continue to move forward in this area. All right, Elisa. Thank you. So um, again, um, just to give you some um, hospital background on um, our facility, um, I work at Riverside Doctors Hospital. Uh, we're a fairly new hospital. Uh, we opened in uh, 2013 and it's a small community hospital. We only have 40 um, beds. Uh, 33 of those beds are medical surgical rooms. We have seven um, ICU beds. We do have a full service emergency department with 12 um, um, bays of patient rooms. Um, we have uh, three surgical services or three OR suites in our sur surgical services area, as well as two procedure rooms, um, you know, a, a pre-op and um, PACU area. Uh, we also have a dedicated um, space for our uh, GI patients. Um, our hospital in itself um, employs about 100, uh, excuse me, 300 employees, um, about 175 of those are nursing employees. Um, as you'll notice, some of our accolades there underneath the picture of our facility, um, we are a niche exemplar um, facility. Um, we received that designation in 2016. We have been a niche uh, member since 2013. Additionally, um, we are uh, we do have the designation as uh, a geriatric um, emergency department. Um, as well as our designation as um, age friendly health system committed uh, to care excellence um, level two. Just to give you some demographics about our facility, um, Doctors Hospital um, is located in a really unique area known as uh, the Greater Williamsburg area, which encompasses York County, James City County, as well as the city of Williamsburg. Um, and Looking at the population within that area, um, greater than the, those the um, 65 years um, or older um, is roughly about 28%. Um, and so reflective of this is our admission demographics from last year. Um, of our admissions in 2023, 60% um, of those were of patients that were um, 65 years or older. Um, and year to date, uh, which is the second half of that graph, um, in 2024, our um, percentage of uh, patients admitted 65 years old or, or greater is 60.4%. Uh, moving on, um, when we were um, working on our designation, uh, uh, designation level two, we had to decide on a uh, uh, population of our patients, which we were going to uh, be um, collecting our da data on. And so we focused on our um, orthopedic patients age 65 and older. Um, you know, our hospital has the distinction where um, all of the patients who have elective orthopedic surgeries, knee replacements, hip, um, replacements and shoulder um, work are done. And so again, just comparative in terms of demographics in um, 2023, um, we um, of our orthopedic patients that were admitted, uh, 40, almost 41% were 65 and older and year to date in 2024, that is about 40%. So um, uh, Lisa and I did step forward uh, and said we wanted to co-chair this steering committee. And that's one thing that you'll learn from the Action Collaborative is that uh, there are tools and, and suggestions about how to form a steering committee. Uh, this process worked really well for us. So I won't go through everybody in the uh, picture here, but this is uh, on the second floor in the med surge unit in the hospital that has received level two designation. And I, I want to recognize that our chief nursing officer for the hospital is pictured here, director of inpatient nursing, uh, Lisa representing uh, as our uh, lead educator, our uh, pharmacist, 
uh, lead therapist, uh, director of quality, um, uh, our IT liaison, who was extremely valuable, um, and several nurses. So just to walk you through briefly a little bit about our history, and again, I, I mentioned it, so it was about two years ago, and we were hearing from several health system leaders that were just asking questions about what is IHI doing in terms of this age-friendly health system process? What does, what do the forums mean to us? How could we um, move forward with our performance uh, focused on the four M's. And so, so the structure, the timing, everything was really aligning. Elisa's already uh, shared with you that this uh, one hospital where we have initially focused our efforts is, has already championed uh, a focus on serving older adults. And the center where I work, which is just down the road from the hospital, the Martha W. Goodson Center, um, situated within our health system provides geriatric assessments, and a large number of programs to support older adults and particularly those with memory loss and also family caregivers. So it just, it, it worked well for us to team together um, and to move this initiative forward. And, and when we wrap up in a little bit, I'll uh, leave you with a few thoughts about um, perhaps one or two of our other hospitals that, that might be next in, in this process. So we joined the action community. We, we took um, Autumn's invitation seriously and um, completed the enrollment paperwork, which I think AHA is providing to you all today to consider. Our hospital president um, was asked to sign off on this and then she endorsed uh, the chief nursing officer really kind of uh, shepherding us through this process as kind of the, the liaison leader. Um, so when we were participating, we noticed that there were more than 30 states um, and 125 sites. Those represented hospitals, large and small healthcare systems, um, uh, primary care sites, specialty care sites, clinics. So um, it was it was eye opening to me um, to understand all the different opportunities that different clinical sites could have in terms of getting the age friendly health system designation. So we decided to focus on one particular unit in our hospital our med surge uh, unit, and um, and then as Elisa mentioned, to focus more specifically on our orthopedic patients. And we're now expanding that more broadly to uh, more of our patients who are over the age of 65 being served in that hospital. So uh, there's a SharePoint page that the action community made available to us with a large number of the resources that Autumn has already shared with you. And then we held um, a number of our own meetings as a steering committee um, alongside the meetings that were happening with the action community, we really appreciated, you know, the kickoffs, uh, the team webinars and the peer coaching opportunities um, that we had. And in fact, I want to give a special shout out to Autumn and, and Manishwar that are on because um, we took the opportunity when they said we're available. Uh, we took that really seriously and we reached out to them and we were able to even set up, you know, one on one coaching with them as we worked through a few challenges. And that was extremely uh, valuable. So you can find, um, this was also something else that we learned uh, on the AHA site, a map so that you could see um, where there might be other uh, sites that have already achieved level one or level two designations. So for us in the Commonwealth of Virginia and particularly in the Eastern region, we were curious to see um, what other health systems and uh, clinical sites had, had achieved and were working towards this designation. We also learned that a large number were uh, using EPIC and I'll come back to that in a little bit and why that's been uh, beneficial to know. And then I think the other thing that we tried to share with our leaders and that we realized as a steering committee and that we were hearing again and again from AHA and the action community is that um, we we're already doing much of this, that we were we were already age friendly, perhaps without this official designation and without kind of we hadn't moved through some of the more formal processes. And so this was really putting a structure. It gave us some guidance. It gave us a timeline and a real structure around something we were already doing. So there was never any suggestion that if you weren't an age-friendly health system designated facility, that you weren't already supporting older adults. It just gave us an opportunity to do a deeper dive into the demographics to better learn about the older adults we were serving, particularly those that were orthopedic, since that is um, uh, such a large um, percentage of those who we serve. And then to really have this, this structure around moving forward. 
Um, we appreciated the timelines and Autumn mentioned this earlier. I can assure you we didn't stick to all these timelines. We try to, um, but again, keep in mind in 2022, we still had the pandemic um, and it didn't want to disappear. And so many times there were things that we had to set aside around the age-friendly work because of the pandemic and because of vaccine clinics and things of that nature. So just quickly in terms of our uh, focus, the first step that you're recommended to do is really dig into once you determine which site that you might want to move forward with this designation is what are the demographics and what's the makeup and there's some guidance and, and worksheets to do that. Um, so that was really helpful. And then again, we reached out to have some personal coaching calls. Um, we were invited to present at the convening to talk about what our health system had learned to date. And then in March, we submitted our care description. And, and actually, when I first joined the action community, I don't even think I knew that there was a distinction between level one and level two. Um, so you heard Autumn describe that earlier. And, and in short, I'd say my understanding of those two is that level one is your, your commitment to the four M's. And you, and you highlight through a document that's provided to you um, your your commitment to the four M's and, and what's referred to as a care description and, and um, opportunities in each of those areas to expand your work and how you're going to um, create these these assessments in this care plan. And then and then really what's happening after you've submitted the care description, assuming that's approved and you receive level one, is that you're then moving on to level two with that three months of data collection. We also had the opportunity to participate in a recognition-a-thon in April that we really appreciated last year. So before I pass it back to Lisa in just a minute, I wanted to share with you, this was something we learned from being a part of the action community was to take celebration seriously uh, because our hospital team members are uh, being asked to do so much, especially in the middle of the pandemic and even now. Um, there's trainings that are coming out. Uh, many of these are mandated by uh, by survey or, or uh, CMS. And so um, it, it, we wanted this to have um, some excitement and some enthusiasm around them. And interestingly, about the same time that we launched this, we had been in one year or so into a pilot around some dementia care training in our hospital. So we had folks kind of on board and thinking more about how they could provide support to older adults in the hospital setting. And so we really were able to work forward from that momentum. But once we received level one, we decided that passing out M&Ms, um, and of course you get two packs of M&Ms if we want to highlight the four M's and, and um, Elisa and others you can see in wear, proudly wearing their M&M shirts. Um, and sharing with our team as a part of the celebration. And that was really fun. And in fact, I think now that we have level two, we probably need to go back and, and continue that celebration. So we did move forward in the fall of last year, uh, focused on collecting three months of data. Um, our IT liaison was extremely helpful in getting new reports built for us in Epic so that we could pull out the data a little bit more easily. For example, what matters was in the storyboard in some cases, in other cases, it was in different parts of the chart, if at all. And so really trying to streamline that was a, was a very valuable process for us. So then what happened was after we submitted the um, data of the three months um, and, and some additional uh, required uh, material, we received feedback from AHA and IHI that we um, needed to resubmit. And uh, I can assure you, we weren't discouraged. We just wanted to make sure we understood. So we reached back out to Autumn and Manishwar and said, help us interpret what we submitted that wasn't uh, helpful or what we need to do to clarify. And, and in short, we had submitted documentation on some older adults who had received three of the four M's. And so we were asked to go back and only submit data on those older adults who had received all four of the M's. And why this was really helpful, it, it, it uh, particularly around mobility, I think there were a few examples. And so we were able to go back and it was an important document for us internally and with the steering committee to say, okay, why did we miss that fourth M and, and what was the fourth M that we missed and what can we do to make sure that we're uh, more comprehensive with all four M's and all of our older adults over 65 in orthopedic cases for this example. So once we learned a little bit more about what we needed to do to adjust our report, we submitted it and there was a quick turnaround where we were notified in April of last year that we had received the level two. Um, we've now prepared a certificate, AHA provides logos and, and some other uh, ways to promote 
um, your status, and that's now on display in our hospital. Alisa? So as part of our uh, journey, um, in terms of data collection, um, we needed to do some re revision with regards to our uh, documentation um, for nursing. Um, as Christine mentioned, we do use the EPIC platform. Um, and so um, in, in you know, looking at our 4Ms, we were looking at where we were gonna um, collect that data. So you'll notice um, as part of this screenshot, uh, required within four hours of admission, we do have a delirium screen. This one particularly, I th the screenshot came up specifically from our ICU because we do use the CAM ICU um, in our um, intensive care unit. Uh, but on our med surge floor, we do use the new disc um, delirium screen um, as well as the fall assessment. Um, required within 24 hours of admission, you'll notice that we um, we use a um, the BMAT, which is a, um, a bedside mobility assessment test. Um, that um, mobility test is also done every shift. So it's done at admission, um, and then it's done uh, as required documentation um, for the shift, um, as well as, again, our delirium screen and our fall assessment. Um, moving on. Um, um, care management um, was looped into our um, process. I will say that when we first started looking at how we were um, going to get our data with regard to um, what matters to the patient, um, we were using um, sticky, no sticky notes. Um, and, um, and it started with our physical therapy team you know, um, again, um, working with our orthopedic patients, you know, what matters to you um, with regard to that. Um, Brandon, our IT um, liaison, um, worked on the back end to start working on our, um, the patient story, um, which we had not been using um, in, in Epic at that time. So um, care management, um, helps to um, fill in um, that information on patient wishes um, in the storyboard as part of their uh, discharge planning flow sheet. And so again, um, just a screenshot of our um, bedside mobility assessment test flow sheet um, in terms of required documentation. Again, um, if, if you're not familiar with that particular tool, um, there are four levels that we do. Um, it, it's, you know, test the, the patient on, um, sit and shake, stretch, stand and step. Um, and then they're scored based on, um, they're given a mobility score. And then um, that information is actually posted um, in the patient's room so that um, everybody who goes into that room knows what kind of assistance they may need, the patient may need um, uh, with regard to ambulation. Um, moving on, um, this is an example of our um, it's already built in our, excuse me, EPICS um, system with regard to, and again, this is an example of um, the delirium screen that we have in our ICU. Um, and again, moving on um, the next screen. Um, and uh, this is a, a screenshot of our, our uh, best practice um, advisory that pops up for our physicians. Um, on admission when they are doing medication reconciliation. Um, the beers list is um, a list of medications, uh, again, that alerts the physician that may be potentially inappropriate for um, the um, older adult. And um, they are then given alternatives to the medication that they you know, were on at home, um, that they could either continue or substitute with um, um, a more appropriate medication. Um, and again, um, when we first uh, started looking at um, medications as one of the four M's, you know, even our beers list um, was um, out of date. It was, um, you know, I, I guess a 2017 
version versus a, a 2020 version. And so um, those things that we weren't using um, needed to be updated. Okay. Thanks, Elisa. Uh -huh. um, so I'll just wrap up here with kind of where where we are. Um, in um, June, our marketing department prepared both internal and external press releases. And again, we had some uh, language and some logos that we could use from um, the American Hospital Association, and we appreciated that. And I think where we are now is really, of course, we know this is evidence-based. If you read through a lot of the reports and, and guides, you'll see um, the evidence behind the four Ms, but I think translating that is where we we are now. Like, how is this impacting patient care? And, and what kind of language do we use that's patient-focused um, and older adult-focused that is meaningful to them? You know, they're not gonna come into our hospital and see our plaque on the wall that designates us as as level two and committed to care excellence. Um, so what are there other ways that we can communicate about this designation that are meaningful to them and likewise meaningful to our team members? So I mentioned the celebrations, but we're needing to, to continue the communication with our own team members in the hospital to say, this wasn't a one and done type of thing. Um, this is an ongoing, this, this is a part of our, our culture and our mission now. And so we want you to continue to give us feedback uh, tell us what's working um, and how we can continue to make revisions and, and build upon the, the work that we've already done the past two years. So as I mentioned earlier, we have two hospitals that are um, a little larger than the hospital that Elisa works in and are um, both in very rural areas. And so uh, they're similar in size. And so what we're actually thinking about for later this year, or perhaps the first quarter of 2025, is that we might roll out um, kind of developing some steering committees and some exploration with these two hospitals simultaneously, uh, because they have some many similar things um, that they can work on together. Um, and that's just something we're we're uh, exploring right now. Um, we want we would like them to be a part of an action community, um, but Elise and I've learned a lot that we also can take and kind of infuse and then know that they would have the resources. So we're trying to decide if the timing would be right now for them to join this action community that will start next month or more likely due to some other initiatives in these hospitals that we might look to next year. Um, and then our fourth hospital, our largest, is really kind of our flagship trauma hospital um, that's in a more uh, urban area. And I think we'll have to look at later in 2025 or 2026 for that one. So um, two other things that I wanted to highlight before I finish up is that um, CMS has a final rule that will be effective next year and AHA will have more, I see Autumn shaking her head, so she's got more resources to share with you about and nodding about that, but um, it's really now um, a new measure for hospitals to, that will be expected to report on our delivery of age-friendly care. And so I think those of us that now have this designation are realizing we might we're not only thankful to AHA, but we feel like we're a little bit maybe ahead of the curve um, because this is now going to be required to use the evidence-based practices to provide this goal-centered care um, for older adults. And that, that's going to be an incentive to these acute care facilities. So I just kind of wanted you to have that on your radar. It might um, engage your stakeholders or your leaders even more so to know that. And then a comment again about EPIC, our electronic health record, which I'm guessing many of you are, are using and are familiar with, is that our IT liaison that we've mentioned several times before and, and are, are so grateful for him being at the table and for his role in this and helping us uh, build and pull out reports. He's also been working directly with the national headquarters for EPIC. And so it does look like there are um, some indications coming down that the four ends are gonna be more uh, seamlessly integrated and more easy for us to pull that data out. So know that that is coming. I don't have a lot of details on that, but I suspect that Autumn and others at uh, AHA are also monitoring that. So um, finally, I provided my contact information and uh, really appreciate this opportunity to, to give you just a little uh, inside view into what we've been doing for the past two years and really appreciate all the support of AHA to get us to this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christy and Elisa, for just 
one, your your participation in the action community and what you're doing for older adults, but also just being available uh, when we need you to come and just share your story uh, with prospective um, action community teams and, you know, just in, anyone. So thank you. Um, on the next slide, I know I did see a lot of great questions coming in the chat. Um, but we'll save Q&A for the end. Hopefully we, we'll get to as much as we can, but I just wanted to highlight a few um, resources that are available to you. So on this slide, you will just see four of the many resources uh, or case studies that are, available, that are available to you through either the AHA website or IHI's website. You can learn more about these different hospital or hospitals and health systems and how they've implemented uh, the four Ms, what was their approach and what were their outcomes. Uh, many of those case studies also have contact information for whoever uh, was like the lead for each of these systems. So if you want to reach out to them, you can reach out to them as well. On the next slide, uh, we also just highlighted, um, let's see, on the next slide, uh, we highlight a, a few of the podcasts that are recently available. Um, so we have some podcasts on geriatric emergency departments. Uh, we had uh, Enhancing Care for Older Adults. Uh, with age-friendly health systems from Cedar sinai um, We also had um, Integrating Age-Friendly Care in an ED with Sharp Girl Smart Hospital out in California. Um, and then recently, we had a collaboration with Rush University Medical Center's uh, Caring for Caregivers program. And so you can check out that podcast in either a video or audio format. But all of these great podcasts are available to you on our webpage, aha.org slash age-friendly. And then on the next slide, um, just a few additional resources. If there are any nursing home teams on the call, or if you are a system that also includes nursing homes, um, there are some guides specific to you um, that you can check out on the webpage. And then uh, finally, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the time here with us today. Uh, we do still have time for Q&A, so please don't hop off just yet. Uh, but just wanted to do a final call um, to invite you to join us for this upcoming action community. Again, our kickoff calls start next month, so it is not too late to join. Um, and then we're always available here for you. Um, if you have questions, if you want to set up a call, um, our email address is right here on the bottom, um, AHA Action Community at aha.org. And we are acti actively monitoring that email inbox. So your email will not just disappear. We will respond to you. Um, and then also, again, when you do receive these slides, you can check out uh, the hyperlink for the um, invitation guide. Um, but yes, now I'm going to turn it back over to you, Rhonda, and thank you all for your time and, and participation today. And we'll just jump into some Q&A. Sounds good. Thanks, Autumn. I have to say, you guys were um, really hopping in, in, the, in the chat over there. So we love to see that kind of engagement. So we'll try and get through just as many of these questions as we can. Uh, certainly, I'll just summarize off the top. There were several questions about EPIC and documentation in EPIC. And I was thankful to see uh, in your last next steps slide, uh, Christine, that EPIC is, appears to be on it. They understand that this documentation is going to be required and they're working on uh, ways to get the four M's into their charting system in a more systematic, accessible way. But can you make any further comments on how people should be documenting these four M's in EPIC until that time arrives when there's a more um, succinct way to do it? Well, I'll start and I'll pass it to Elisa. And again, we um, continue to give a shout out to our IT liaison who knows EPIC uh, inside and out and is able to pull these reports. So um, I think, you know, finding out where, um, for example, with the implementation and delirium. So Elisa mentioned, you know, there are already tools that we were tracking. Um, so knowing where those tools are and um, and then how to pull out. And, and we created reports actually just in Excel, um, just so we could start to document by patient which of these screenings um, were being done and at what times, um, because that was also a part of your of your care description is determining how frequently that you're going to assess on these. So 
Um, I'm going to pass it to Elisa because I'm not, because of my uh, setting, I'm not regularly in the patient's charts, but have definitely benefited from being able to access these reports and learn from folks like Elisa on, who is on, on the floor every day with these patients about how you have to go into all these different screens within Epic to find things. And again, Rhonda, we hope that it will be a little bit more streamlined soon, but Elisa, your thoughts on that? So uh, I'm just looking at the chat um, with regard to um, some of the questions that are in the chat box. Someone asked if we um, include um, same day joint um, admissions as part of our numbers. No, we do not um, because um, our same day joints uh, are considered outpatient ambulatory. Um, and so they are not uh, counted into our inpatient numbers. Um, the med surge delirium screening tool that we use is the new disc, NU capital D E S C. Um, and again, um, uh, and then in our ICU, we use the uh, uh, CAM or the confusion assessment um, measurement, um, which is a CAM ICU. Um, uh, looking at, yes, everything for the most part is captured in EPIC. Um, Christy briefly mentioned that we have um, um, an initiative that was uh, started here at our hospital on um, dementia awareness and um, part of my routine when I come into the hospital every morning is I, I actually look at our patient census and I specifically um, uh, do a, a slice on our, our inpatient of all of those patients that are 65 years and older, whether or not they have dementia or not, um, um, to see what our, the, the caseload is. Um, but yes, most of our uh, data collection does come directly from, um, from EPIC um, with the help of our um, IT liaison. Um, let me see. That's great, Elisa. Um, thanks for commenting on that. Um, Lord, as a nurse, I'm a, a three decades of hands-on nursing. And so that documentation piece is so important. And we all have a love-hate relationship with Epic and or Cerner, but necessary evils. And they do give us opportunity to capture the information that uh, the regulatory agencies are requiring. So speaking of that requirement, there were a couple of questions in the chat asking you to please expand a little bit more on that recent announcement of CMS approval on age-friendly measures. So could one of you speak to that? So our quality um, officer at the hospital is the one that's keeping us posted on that. And what I could do in just a minute is I'll drop a link into the chat that will give you all more information about the CMS final rule because I was grateful that she notified us of it. Um, and so I just, I, it, I think it's very new. And so I'm just sharing what I know as of this point, I, um, I think it gives, uh, the sites that are represented today, it gives you again, additional kind of leverage to say not, this is now coming and it's going to be a part of, um, the survey process. So let me, um, go pull up a link and I'll drop that into the chat and perhaps that'll give you a little bit more background on some of the specific language. Thanks, Christine. And I'm sorry to say this next question is for you too. I'm going to make you multitask. So now that CMS has finalized the measure, do you plan to accelerate your implementation at your other facilities? Uh, great question. I uh, don't know yet. Um, I appreciate that uh, thought. I think it gives us an opportunity to do that. Um, and Elise and I need to probably talk about this a little bit more because I think we've only hinted that this might be coming to these other two hospitals and we don't want to impose anything on them. You know, we want we want them to um, be involved and again, have a steering committee and lead this the way that they want. Um, but it, there might be, uh, it might be a little bit more time sensitive. So um, don't know yet, but really appreciate that question. It, it'll be something that as we invite these other two hospitals to consider moving through this process that we, um, you know, let them know that's another key piece to this to move forward. And along with that, just the idea, uh, again, of expansion of the program, there was a question wondering, is it possible to start with just a pilot unit 
before you expand the assessment and documentation on this to the entire hospital? I, I think that's pretty much what we did, what we've described. So I'm glad someone asked that um, because we did not track on all patients 65 and older. Uh, I suspect there are probably other sites that have gone through level two and achieved that that have, that might be another resource. But we decided after a good bit of deliberation um, and the extensive number of patients who were coming in for orthopedic procedures, that that was the pilot that was the pilot focus. And Elisa, before I pass it to you, just thinking one more thing was that we can kind of add to that is we also weren't sure when we first started the action community, are we applying as a hospital and is it all units within the hospital? And we learned, no, it doesn't have to be. And so that's why I mentioned our med surge unit, our inpatient unit is where we decided to focus. We could go focus next on our EV, for example. Right. Um, so Elisa, your thoughts? I was going to say, initially, I think when we were looking at the process, we were originally looking at um, the emergency room, dovetailing it into our geriatric emergency room um, designation. Um, but the, their documentation their documentation in EPIC is much different than it is on MedSurge in terms of yeah. Our, yeah, gathering data. And so uh, we focused more on our MedSurge units. I think that's a uh, fascinating, um, better watch your time here, thing to think about as an, a career ED nurse um, in emergency department, um, you know, we're, we're always complaining about how much we have to document in such little frameworks of time that we have with some of these patients. And so wanting to pump that on to our inpatient units. But the, it does raise the question with this new CMS rule, do you anticipate or does anyone know if there will be a requirement in any department where you see patients that are 65 years and up, will there be aspects of this new CMS rule that will be um, required in each and every area? Um, that may be a preemptive question too far down the road to know that yet, but just wondered if you had any insight there. Well, I'm looking, I just dropped a very long link into the chat that I hope will be helpful. And I'm also looking at a table that I can't drop into the chat that our quality director sent. And so I'm in my email looking here and bear with me. Let's see. So um, there are a variety of domains, domain attestations. Um, there are five of them. So eliciting patient health care goals, responsible medication management, frailty screening and intervention, so, social vulnerability, and domain five, age-friendly care leadership. So I can at least give you that. Um, and again, you should find that table. Um, the only other kind of comment I can give here, again, thanks to our quality director, the age-friendly hospital measure is a focused composite metric that comprises a handful of structural metrics such as staffing and roles specific to older adults, process metrics such as frailty assessments and delirium screenings and outcomes fo focused on activities that are essential for effective care with this demographic. If finalized, the measure would be a positive step towards incentivizing team-based care organized around the older adult patient. And it, it does seem that it is finalized now. Okay, well, thanks, Christine. More to come, I'm sure, um, for all of us as this measure goes uh, goes live for 2025. So we are at the top of the hour here. Want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, as the webinar concludes and closes off, you will have an evaluation pop up onto your screen. Super important to us that you fill that out really helps both us here at the AHA and our speakers know um, what we've done well to meet your need and uh, where um, we could continue to focus for improvements for next time. So please do fill out that evaluation. Autumn, is there anything else to add here at the end? Uh, no, no, I think we're all good. Thank you so much, Rhonda and uh, the Riverside team. All right, thanks to all. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.